Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's tutorial is based on the waltz in A flat major, opus 34, number one by Frédéric Chopin. This beautiful waltz is part of a set of three waltzes um, from Opus 34. They were written in the mid-1830s and published in 1838. I love this piece very much. It was part of my program at the 2015 National Chopin Competition, part of the quarter, quarter final round. And I wrote to the National Chopin Foundation and asked if I could use footage from the competition in some of these pro practice tutorials and they kindly gave me permission. So usually I like to start the tutorial off with playing a small portion of the piece in case you're not familiar with it, but today we have an entire performance of it from that 2015 uh, National Chopin Competition quarterfinal round. I hope you all enjoy this. After the performance, we'll dig into the tutorial section of this video.
All right. I hope you all enjoyed that or found ideas that you don't want to do. I find that listening to recordings can always be beneficial because it can either show you things that you want to do, it can inspire new ideas based on the performer's interpretation, or it can give you strong opinions of what you don't want to do. So I'm sure there are things that I did in that performance that you may not want to do, or perhaps there's a few things that you do want to incorporate. Today we will be digging into many things. We'll be going over some basics like how to move the hand more efficiently, to use less tension to get rid of tension in the hand. Um, we'll be going over pedaling with the pedal cam here. So uh, I won't be notating, I won't be uh, dictating a lot of pedal markings. We'll be going over various interpretations. This piece is very repetitive. Um, as you could tell from that performance, the themes come back many different times. And it's important to distinguish each iteration of a theme with something a little different. Now, you don't have to be black and white. You don't have to say, I was forte here the first time. I've got to be pianissimo the next time. You can do similar things, but make sure there's always variety. And I remember preparing for that Chopin competition and being very diligent with saying, okay, how can I vary not only dynamics, but how could I get creative with articulation, pedaling, and uh, rubato. So we'll be going over a lot of that today as well. Just looking quickly at the structure of the piece, we have an introduction in the first 16 bars. So starts with that, and then it obviously ends. Let's see. And melt into this first theme. And that first theme continues into that little bit more playful, jovial character. When we get over to uh, bar 49, the pickup to 49, we see this more spirited theme. So we can just go ahead and call that theme two. And then, um, these are just my labels. Uh, and then when we get to 81, bar 81, we have this very tranquil theme in the key of D-flat major. It does have some contrast in there, as we see over in bar 121. Or actually, it starts a little bit before that. It starts in bar 112. But still part of that main uh, third theme. And then we see a return to that second theme, kind of that jovial. But this time it's in D flat major. And it's a little deceptive to call that D flat major because he's modulating all over the place, but we do see it settle in bar 160 on D flat major. So we see that return of the second theme. And then in bar 177, uh, the pickup to 177, we see a direct modulation back to the first theme. Back in A flat major, back in the home key. We see again that second theme. come back in 209 and then we see a coda in bar 245 and a lot of performers including me like to do a little accelerando in there we'll be discussing that so that gives you a general idea of how the piece is structured I generally like to think of them in three main themes uh, with an introduction and a coda. Um, again, we see theme one staying in A flat major. Theme two starts in A flat major. Theme three, D flat major. And then we see that second theme come back in D flat major. So just having those labels in your mind is very helpful for memorizing and also coming up with various interpretations 
and how you want to contrast those. Okay, so that's uh, just a little overview of the form. I always like to try to start with a bit of that to help the organization of your practice. All right, going into some mechanics of the hand in here. Uh, starting off, surprisingly, when I was young and learned this, I, I was pretty curved and I would actually sometimes slip off those notes. So as I progressed in my studies, um, I noticed that just having a slightly flatter finger and a little bit more curved this way and kind of going in like that. So that really helps the clarity. So, and one thing that Sergei Babayan told me, this was in a totally different piece, the Chopin Etude Opus 10 number four with in that left hand, he said, think of a little hole punch being glued to the key and replace the finger on that same hole punch. I think that applies nicely here. We've talked about that in, in La Campanella before, where if you play on different parts of the key, it's really easy to not get that clarity. But if you focus on loosely playing on the exact same part of the key, it doesn't have to be pinpoint the exact place, but that will help you to get the clarity because the note will have to release if you're playing on the same part. If you go up here, it's easy to have no clarity between the notes. Okay, now it's tempting right there. We see Vivace, Grand Valsbriand, uh, you know, all the indications of like, this should be huge, but make sure that you're still thoughtful. Forte with an accent, now regrow to the next accent. And then I like to spread the hand out. And when I play on quick black key passages, I do play a, a bit more on the pad of my finger because that gives me a little bit more room for error, a little bit more margin of error. Okay. Also, here come down forz, forzando and then regrow and then to there. It's pretty easy to see in this Ecure edition all of those markings, but it's important to remember those because I've seen students play this. That's just hideous. Um, so. Just a slight change in dynamics and it livens it right up. It keeps it big. Now, uh, but interesting, the audience is never gonna say, wow, he got really soft on that E flat right there. And wow, that first chord was way too soft. It still appears to be big to the audience, but it's interesting and big. It's not just a wall of sound. Okay, so this first one, I still like to get nice and big, but this next one, even more, and then to there. And I might even take a little bit of time to get to there, and then I take the opportunity there to be big, because I don't want to drop off a cliff there. So big, then get softer, and then this one's much softer. This one's bigger and then I roll that. My hand's huge, and I can barely reach that, and I couldn't play that loud, so. Plus, I love the sound of that rolled chord, so. And right there, around this E flat, somewhere in here is when I start to feather the pedal, so coming off, and up, down, up, down. There isn't a huge retard written in there, so you don't want to, you know, milk that and... It's like, get on with it, right? <laughs> so... But even in box music, where people get very self-righteous about never taking any time uh, and being completely even, even in box music, we have to breathe. And so 
there might be a tiny bit of retire, and this is romantic music. This is far after the Baroque era, but so we can definitely massage that with a little bit of time. What that does, it not only helps prepare us. Uh, I mean, we've just been preparing that dominant, 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 the key of E flat, E flat seven. Finally, we go to A flat in bar 17. So it's a lot of built up tension. Even if the audience knows nothing about music theory, there is an inherent uh, buildup of tension. I remember hearing a story recently. I think it was Graham Fitch that said that but it may have been someone else. Um, Mozart's dad would get him up in the morning by doing that. And Mozart had to come down and play that C on the piano in order to resolve in his head. So this is a big buildup of... of finally resolving E flat seven, resolving to A flat. All right, moving on to uh, the arrival of this first theme. So just think of that opening as an introduction. It's a dominant chord. It's, it's a little strange that a piece in, e, uh, in A flat major starts so boldly on that. I mean, it's not unheard of uh, for compositions to start on the dominant and then resolve to the tonic. But most often, if we look at the very next waltz, for instance, Opus 34, number two. This is a waltz in A minor. Well, if you look at the Opus 34, number three, man, I'm really uh, proving my point wrong here. However that one goes, I haven't played number three. Um, that also starts on the dominant, but a lot of works do not start on the dominant. So um, just allow this introduction to build up. Okay, moving on to the first theme. I like to start this pretty uh, tranquil, very thoughtful. I don't like to be in your face. I think that sounds corny and cheesy. It sounds too joyous. Um we have a lot of joy and rambunctious material coming up. So I like this to be quite peaceful, elegant. Maybe a little more. A little note on those quick trills. So. often referred to as upper mordants. It depends on the um, time period you're in, but I like to refer to these as trills. I like to do 3-4-3 three, three on these. Now, 3-4-3 three, three is my least favorite finger combination on the piano. I, yeah, I'd, I'd actually probably almost rather take 4-5 in a lot of instances, which you could totally do there as well. But 3-4-3, three, three, for whatever reason, feels really good in my hand there. What you want to make sure you do with little trills to get clarity is you always want two elements to a trill. I've taught this many times on my channel, but you need finger action. But don't stop there. Uh, you need rotation as well. It's tiny, so my hand kind of turns a doorknob up the keyboard and then goes back. If the thumb also lifts there, it helps the hand to have the weight behind that finger. Um, even when we're playing a basic scale, A lot of students will play like this. I've even run into trouble, you know, in real fast speeds doing this kind of stuff where I don't allow the arm to freely move with that. So as you do these little uh, trills or upper mordants, make sure it's just, you can also use kind of an in out circular motion on that one. So. So kind of going in with the hand, but a little bit of a turn as well. So just uh, what I'm getting at is involve the arm in that process. Do not just try to do it with your fingers because most likely you're going to get a lack of clarity or you'll get an, a random accent and you're for sure going to have tension if you just isolate those fingers. So be very careful of that.
right. It's my opinion that you probably shouldn't be playing this waltz uh, as your first waltz, starting with something much easier if you want to stay with Chopin. Or even something like that. So uh, the A minor posthumous waltz or the Opus 69 number one B minor waltz. Those were the two examples I just gave. Having said that, if you're struggling with <laughs> basic waltz technique, this is what I wanted to get. I have a video on YouTube called the chord combo exercise. Just jot that down if you're struggling with left-hand accuracy. Um, I'll quickly go over it. So you do every chord combination you can think of, every note combination. So if you're doing this and you're really struggling to get that accurate, I would just play bottom notes, middle note, top note. Now bottom and middle. Now bottom and, uh, sorry, middle and top. Now the outers. And now the whole chord. If you do that enough times um, and you do it in all those different combinations, you will gain a confidence like you wouldn't believe. It, it's amazing that that exercise, I, I originally taught that for Scarbo um, from Ravel's Gaspar de la Nuit. Uh, to a student and it helped him tremendously and it's helped me actually since I taught him that and I had to kind of come up with that exercise for him uh, it has helped me in a lot of cases as well it can certainly help here so just a, a, again a little bit of basics to start off this video um, but important uh, things that can help tidy up inaccuracies if you're struggling with that so jumping back down to bar 29 I like to kind of melt there so let me get into it starting in 26. The little time. So the the achacatura, that little grace note with the backslash through it is called an achacatura. I would play the last note of those trills, same thing on the previous one. The last note of the trill comes with the rest of the notes. Same thing here right there. So I don't like, there are places where I'll put trills on the beat in Chopin, but the norm is to do them before the beat. So same thing there. And I like a four note trill there. Again, trills, whether you do a three or a four note depends on the voice leading and it depends on personal preference. Um, again, the norm is to do a four note trill, but there's Throughout this piece, I'm doing a lot of three note little uh, trills. So this is a perfect example right here. I think that sounds too busy with the four notes. So a little note about movement. <laughs> 